Hey, what's up, y'all? Pete here. I want to make a video not on yet another instance of police employee abuse, but a book review. Uh, a book by Michael Quinn called Walking with the Devil. I learned of this book a couple weeks ago from my friends uh, based here in Minnesota, Paul Leeson, who started Minnesota Cop Block, and Drew Henderson, who since joined them him there, and who you may know of, uh, he had a little incident that happened in Little Canada. Walking with the Devil, The Police Code of Silence, What Bad Cops Don't Want You to Know and Good Cops Won't Tell You, came out in 2005. The author, Mike Quinn, worked for Minneapolis Police for almost 24 years. The main thrust of the book is to encourage current police employees to do the right thing, to abstain from involvement with the Code of Silence. The Code, as Quinn says in the book, is the singularly most powerful influence on police behavior in the world, as much a part of being a cop as the badge and the gun. And yet he pulls back the curtain on the code, saying that it's really about lies and deception, and ultimately that it destroys the trust people have in cops. Quinn outlines scenarios and real-world examples in which the allure and ease of just going along with the code may be tempting, but he appeals to one's integrity and the oath sworn to uphold as more worthwhile pursuits. Quinn admits that every day in newspapers we can find another instance of police abuse or criminal behavior. He acknowledges that police employees' use of creative report writing and test lying is commonplace. He also takes aim at drug prohibition, which he cites as the direct cause for the change in police philosophy from protect and serve to convict and incarcerate. And he includes in his book a list of police employee whistleblowers and the 10 myths of policing, in which he refutes in over 30 pages the belief of some police employees that in order to achieve justice, they must be heavy-handed. Overall, I agree with much of Quinn's assessments, though I feel he stopped short in some key areas, which I'll get to in just a moment. Though we share a common end goal to rid policing of the code of silence, the means that he advocates using to do that won't be effective, and that he admits. Knowing we will never eliminate it, we can prepare ourselves by analyzing how the code of silence works. Quinn's solution? Perhaps increase the educational requirements and better on-the-job training, but ultimately he points to individuals acting within the current structure. We can change the police culture from within, he claims. If just one cop stands up and says no more, many cops will stop their legal and unethical acts in the presence of that cop. But is that really a deterrent for the unjust actions to continue just outside of sight? I personally don't believe it accurate to call someone good when they remain silent about the actions of another. Think about it this way. If that police employee would have arrested or charged you for engaging me in the same act, failure to do so to a colleague means they're in the wrong and that they act according to double standards. Quinn admits the very real inertia built into the police institution. As long as cops are investigating cops, the code of silence will usually prevail and the public will never get a true picture of what is going on in the street. And unless the motivation is extremely powerful, like being sent to prison, cops don't tell on other cops. If Quinn were serious about ending the code of silence, he would encourage police employees to not just let their colleagues know of their disapproval, but to go public with it, no matter the risks. The police employee that is aware of misdeeds done by colleagues could go to police accountability advocates or reporters, as is increasingly being done every day, or they could create an outlet and share the information anonymously. Or, as Adrian Schoolcraft did when his NYPD colleagues were up to no good, they could capture audio or video of the misdeeds and make that public. Those tactics would afford an entirely new magnitude of insight and transparency into the closed ranks of policing, which are now protected by this code of silence. Though Quinn only mentions it once in the entire book, a much more effective tactic than believing police will police themselves is the introduction of a camera. When confronted with video camera footage or audio recordings, the code becomes a trap. The first cop to tell the truth is usually the one to escape permanent damage. The camera simply captures the truth, and the truth is a very powerful disinfectant. Quinn wrote that most cops don't start their careers believing the ends justify the means. Then he says that the explanation on the adoption of the code of silence isn't easy. While I agree with the first part of the statement, most police employees don't start out with evil intentions. I disagree strongly with the second part of his statement, that the causes are amorphous or complex. They're not. It comes down to incentives. This is my biggest point of divergence from Quinn, what I see as a failure to recognize the fact that policing as an institution has a flawed foundation, and because of that, the code of silence can never be uprooted completely. In no uncertain terms, the core of the policing apparatus is based on coercion. It says a certain group of people has the right to steal from others under the guise of protecting them. The code of silence is but a destructive attribute of that toxic environment. They are inseparable. Acknowledging that is key to understanding why the code of silence exists. 
While Quinn correctly pointed out that this wasn't a local or regional problem, he claimed it was a nationwide problem. But in fact, it is an international problem that exists anywhere a group of people claims and is granted the right to do things said to be wrong for others. If our communities knew the truth, Quinn wrote, they would never approve of some of the things we do in the name of justice. If the truth were out there, many would see past the illusions that allow these institutions and the code to exist. Police employees would cease to be seen as a monolith, and any claims of extra protection afforded to their actions would evaporate. Instead, they'd be seen as individuals responsible for their actions, as are you and I. Quinn started the first chapter of his book with a quote by Edmund Burke. It is necessary only for the good man to do nothing for evil to triumph. It's one we're all familiar with, and it's one we need to act upon if we really do want to make a positive change. Shortly after I learned of this book, I reached out to Mike Quinn to see if he'd sit down to do an interview. Initially, he accepted, but soon after, he recanted. Uh, when I inquired why, what the rationale for that was, he said that he had checked out the site and he had found some of the language used on some of the posts more inflammatory than necessary. I responded, I agreed with him in that assessment that some of the language is more inflammatory than necessary, but I tried to reiterate the fact that the site is decentralized, so each piece of content only speaks for the author themselves and not for all involved. But to his credit, Quinn, um, you know, as he stressed throughout the book, the, the integrity and the, and the importance of the that characteristic, he, he noted that in the past he used to write for Officer.com, but that he chose to disassociate himself with that site after some other authors there put up some content about uh, police employees being immune for their actions. 